This program on direct current will cover such material as voltage, which is the pressure that moves the current in a circuit, current, which is the actual electron flow in the circuit, and resistance, which limits and controls the electron flow. As you shall see, for any circuit to function properly, it must have voltage to move the electrons, current to do the work, and resistance to control the current flow within the circuit. We will study the series circuit and learn how to identify them. We will learn how to use Ohm's law to calculate and measure the current, resistance, and voltage drops in a DC circuit. Next we will study the parallel circuit and see how the characteristics of this circuit differ from those of the series circuit. Then we will study a combination called the series parallel circuit. We will use the information we gain from the two separate circuits to calculate for the current, resistance, and voltage measurements in the series parallel circuit. We will also review the digital multimeter and learn how to properly use it for making the various tests and measurements required for troubleshooting electrical circuits. In this program you will also learn how to read the color bands on a resistor. Resistors are used in almost every electronic circuit. The resistor will perform many functions, two of which are as current limiting devices and as voltage dividers in a circuit. All matter has electrical properties. This is why engineers over the past several decades have been able to develop thousands of devices that generate, store, control, and switch electricity. The diode, transistor, and integrated circuits are but just a few of these devices. The best way to understand electricity as an essential ingredient of matter is to understand the nature of every element, the atom. The atom consists of a nucleus made up of protons and neutrons. The atom also has electrons that encircle the nucleus. The electron has a negative electrical charge and the proton has a positive electrical charge, while the neutron has mass but no electrical charge. Normally an atom has an equal number of electrons and protons. As long as this balance exists, there is no electrical charge. It is possible to dislodge one or more electrons from most atoms. This causes the atom to have a positive electrical charge. It is then called a positive ion. On the other hand, if a stray or free electron combines with a neutral atom, the atom will have a negative electrical charge. It is then called a negative ion. Electrons can either rest on a surface as they do on the plates of a capacitor or move through a material as they do in a resistor. Each has its place in the field of electronics. When electrons form on a surface as they do on the plates of a capacitor, it causes the surface to become negatively charged. Since the electrons are not moving, the surface can be said to have a negative static electrical charge. On the other hand, the current will continue to flow through a resistor as long as there is a voltage being applied forcing the electrons through the device. This is referred to as dynamic current flow. Most of the time static electricity is not desired in electronic circuits because it can and will cause severe damage to electronic devices. Therefore special care is required when handling printed circuit boards which contain solid state devices. Materials used in electronic circuits are usually classified as conductors or insulators. There is also a third type of material used which is referred to as semiconductor material. We will discuss semiconductor materials in another program. What is a conductor? Any material which electrons pass through freely is called a conductor. Conductors include such materials as gold, silver, copper, iron, aluminum, and most metals. Conductors are used to connect the various components together to form a useful circuit. On the other hand, an insulator is a material which electrons pass through poorly or not at all. Insulators include such materials as glass, plastic, wood, rubber, mica, porcelain, leather, and paper. Insulators are used to insulate voltages from ground potentials and other devices. Insulators are used on electrical devices for our protection as well as to protect the device from shorting to ground and damaging the circuit. 
When an electric current flows through a wire, it creates a magnetic field around the wire. This field is referred to as an electromagnetic field. Also, when a wire passes through a magnetic field, it induces a voltage into the wire. This is a very desirable effect of electricity. If it were not for this effect, electronics as we know it would not exist. It is this magnetic field that makes motors, transformers, coils, analog meters, and many other devices work in electronic circuits. For any electrical circuit to operate properly, it must first meet certain requirements. First, there must be a power source from which the electrons may leave and return. The power source could be a battery, a solar cell, a power supply, or any device which generates an electrical voltage. The power source produces the pressure which forces the current through the circuit. The power source also produces the current which flows through the circuit. Next, we must have a load which uses the electricity that is produced by the power source. The load could be a light bulb, resistor, motor, transformer, integrated circuit, or any other device which uses electricity. We must also have a way to connect the power source to the load. Therefore, we need some form of conductor. Remember, a conductor is anything which allows the electrons to flow through it easily. Wire is a commonly used conductor. Another common conductor is the copper clad foil used on printed circuit boards. The conductor allows the electrons to leave the power source and travel to the load, then back to the power source. This creates a closed loop path for the electrons to flow and perform the job the circuit was designed to do. The power source, load, and conductors are all that is required to make a simple electrical circuit function. Now that we've seen what it takes to make a functioning circuit, let's find out what voltage, current, and resistance are and see how they relate to one another. A mathematical relationship between voltage, current, and resistance was found to exist by George Simon Ohm in 1846. This relationship was a most important discovery in electricity and it was named Ohm's Law in his honor. The equation for Ohm's law is voltage over current times resistance, or simply stated, E over I times R. E represents the voltage, I represents the current, and R represents the resistance. We shall see that by knowing any two of these three variables, the third can be calculated very easily. Before going any further into Ohm's law, let's learn a little bit about voltage, current, and resistance to find out how each of these affect the circuit. The first variable we shall look at is the voltage, which is represented by the letter E in the Ohm's Law equation. Other technical terms for voltage are electromotive force, difference of potential, IR drop, and volts. Of these, the term volt and voltage are the most frequently used. Voltage is measured in a unit called the volt and can be thought of as the pressure which causes the electrons to flow in the circuit. Without this pressure, the electrons would not flow. The greater the pressure, the more the electrons will flow through the circuit. If the resistance does not change and the voltage doubles, the electrons flowing through the circuit will also double. The next variable we shall look at is the resistance, which is represented by the letter R in the Ohm's Law equation. Resistance is the opposition to the electron flow in the circuit and is measured in a unit called the ohm. When the resistance of a circuit drops to zero, it is called a short circuit and it causes the power to produce a high amount of current. If the power source can produce enough current, it will burn the conductor open, which in turn will cause an open circuit and will no longer allow the electrons to flow through the circuit. A short circuit can also destroy the power source. There are various types of resistors. Some of the more common types are carbon, wire wound and photoresistors. Carbon resistors make up the majority of the resistors used in modern circuits. Wire wound resistors are used as precision resistors and in high power applications. Photoresistors on the other hand are light sensitive devices. The resistance of the photoresistor will decrease as the intensity of the light source is increased. 
This gives the photoresistor capabilities far beyond that of a regular resistor. Resistors come in fixed and variable sizes. Here we see two types of variable resistors. One is called a rheostat and the other is called a potentiometer or simply POT for short. If you notice, the rheostat is a two-wire device and the potentiometer is a three-wire device. The rheostat has one fixed terminal and one variable terminal. The potentiometer, on the other hand, has two fixed terminals and one variable terminal. Variable resistors are used for adjusting circuits to meet certain requirements. Here we see the schematic symbol for the fixed resistor, rheostat and potentiometer. The rheostat and potentiometer each have an arrow pointing toward the resistor body. This is the variable lead of the device. The third variable we shall look at is the current, which is represented by the letter I in the Ohm's Law equation. Current is measured in a unit called the ampere, or amp for short. Current is the actual electron flow through the circuit. It is the current which flows through the device which makes the device useful. As you recall, Ohm's Law gave us the equation of E over I times R. We have now learned that E represents volts, I represents the current, and R represents the resistance. We also found out that current is the actual electron flow through the device. Therefore, if we have a given voltage being applied to a fixed resistance, we can calculate for the current flowing through the device by knowing the voltage and the resistance. For example, if we have a voltage of 1 volt being applied to a resistance of 1 ohm, we will have 1 amp of current flowing through the device. This was calculated by using the Ohm's Law equation I equals E over R. This translates to 1 volt divided by 1 ohm, which equals 1 amp of current. When working with electronic circuits, the current flow is usually very small. So there is a kind of shorthand used to represent these smaller values of current. We have the milliamp and the microamp. Usually the term milliamp is printed with a small letter M followed by the letter A. One milliamp is equal to one one thousandth of an amp of current. The microamp is usually represented by the Greek letter mu. One microamp is equal to one millionth of an amp of current. You will see these two terms used a lot in schematic diagrams. Let's pause for a review of the material covered so far. So far we have seen that voltage is the pressure that moves the electrons through the circuit. We have also seen that we must have resistance to limit the amount of current flowing through the circuit. Also important to remember is that current is another term for the electron flow through the circuit. By using Ohm's law, if we know the value of the voltage being applied to the circuit and we know the resistance of the circuit, we can calculate for the current by dividing the resistance into the voltage. Also, if the current and resistance of the circuit are known, we can calculate for the voltage by multiplying the current times the resistance. And finally, if we know the voltage and current, we can calculate for the resistance by dividing the current into the voltage. As you now see, by knowing the value of any two of the variables, the third can be calculated very easily. Incidentally, an easy way to remember Ohm's law is to write down the equation and then simply cover the unknown value and do what the instructions say for the other two values. For example, cover the E with your hand. You instantly will see the I times R or current times resistance to determine the voltage. Cover the I and the formula becomes E over R or resistance divided into voltage. And finally when you cover the R, the formula is simply E over I or current divided into voltage.